Hey, how are you doing today? Welcome back. So this is a video I promised you uh, if you watched the last one uh, where we were looking at uh, normal stresses in a beam. Uh, and this is where we're going to build a component that's going to analyze any sort of generic I-beam, asymmetric I-beam, T-beam uh, to get the fundamental cross-sectional properties. Now we're going to do it uh, in a fun little way. We're going to use uh, arrays to control and manage the data. It, that's going to stop us from having these really long and obtuse formulas going all the way across our page. But it's also going to allow us to recognize the formulas that we put in. They look the same as they would in a textbook or in your notes or, or anywhere else. So I think it's going to look a lot better. It's going to read a lot better and it's going to function a lot better. So I've got it laid out on the uh, on the screen in the workshop uh, worksheet. Uh, I have a sort of a generic uh, beam laid out, obviously, which is an I-beam, the bottom flange, the dimensions would be the same as the top flange. Uh, if it was a T-beam, then the thickness of the bottom flange would have to go to zero, and I put a note here just to, to show that. Uh, we're going to break it up into logical sections, uh, one being the top flange, two the web, three the bottom flange. And then that's just to show the logic that we're going to use as we set up our uh, our sheet. We've already set up a range variable for i, which is going to align with uh, components one, two, and three. Uh, and we're pretty much ready to get on with it. Uh, oh, I guess the last thing I should mention, I have set the origin equals one. Uh, that obviously matters when we're talking about range variables and arrays. So we're going to be moving from one, index of one is the first one, and then on up from there. So uh, let's uh, scroll down and get this going so it doesn't take us too long. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to need to know the value for the areas for the three components. And so we'll put that here. And so we're going to, again, remember we're doing arrays. So we're using the open square bracket and the first one will align with the top flange. And so that's going to be equal to the thickness of the flange at the top multiplied by the width of the flange top. And we set that equal and we get a value out. So this seems fine. Let's just copy that, paste it a couple times. So now a two, so I'm just going to change that for a two, may as well change this for a three while we're at it. So instead of being the top flange, it's going to be the thickness of the web. And then we need the height of the web. Now the way the cross section was uh, defined up here, we don't have the height of the web. So we're going to have to use the height overall and subtract the two thicknesses of the flange. So we'll just do that in there. I'll stick it all in brackets just to keep it tidy. So it's the height overall minus the thickness of the flange top minus thickness of the flange bottom. And we get a value. Let's see, that looks good. Move that over and then here, this is instead of top, this is now bottom. Excellent. So we're away to the races. And so just to show you how this is all going to come together really nice and sweet and tidy. Uh, why don't we calculate the area total? So in case we need to know our cross sectional area, we'll assign it to area total. I'm just going to go up to our math, choose our operators, pick up a summation sign. We're going to sum it over the range variable I and it is just a sum of, oh, sorry, A, remember open square bracket, I, and we hit equals, and we get our value back out. And you see how nice and tidy that is without having these individual variables uh, come across. So let's uh, just move that in so we can get it all on the page. Move it over a little bit. There we go. And uh, we'll bash right on. So we're building up, of course, to get our centroid is the first thing we need to know. So now we'll need to know the distances from the bottom of the cross section 
uh, to the centroids or the component centroids. And that's going to facilitate that calculation. And we're just going to do it the same way here. We're going to use our y's and then open square bracket one. And so this is for our top flange. And so that's going to be the height of the overall height minus half the thickness of the top flange. So top flange thickness, flange thickness or flange top uh, divided by two. Of course, you don't have to hit the equal sign here. You don't have to see what the values are. And <clears throat> so our distance from the bottom to the centroid of the web is then going to be our thickness of the flange bottom plus half the thickness of the web height. So we don't have the web height again. Uh, but we have this component up here, which we know is the web height, so we should be able to use that. And there we go. So it's always interesting how you can copy and paste from previous sections. And our third component is the bottom flange, and that's just going to be half the flange thickness divided by two, or half the flange thickness, there you go. Yeah, sorry, hit an equal sign. And so if you're starting to wonder what these arrays look like, I mean, you can always bring it up just by going like A equals or Y equals. And you see how this is nice and compact and carrying that information forward in a really simple to use way. So the fun thing is, is we need to calculate where our centroid is. So let's just get a title over here. Okay, scroll up. And so this is, of course, denoted by y bar equals two. Uh, and we're going to go up again, pick up our summation sign, and in the, again, over the range variable. And that's going to be the individual areas multiplied by yi. Now, all of this, of course, is divided by area total. Now when I did this up, I didn't have my area total calculated, so I just showed it this way, which is not a bad way to do it, because that's typically the way it's written down in the textbooks. And you see that, and we hit our equal sign, and there we go. We have the height to the centroid. You can see with that larger top flange, we're up over half the height, which makes a, a great deal of sense. So I think we're pretty happy with that. <clears throat> so we have our first major uh, parameter for the cross section. Uh, the next one is to get the actual uh, moment of inertia or the second moment of area, if you prefer. Let's just get that set up. Okay, so uh, I've got all of that ready. Uh, the first thing you need to know is the distances from the neutral axis, which we now know where it is, to the individual component centroids, and we typically denote those as D within the parallel axis theorem formula. So we're going to set that up. So D at I is equal to, now if you give this a little bit of thought, you can basically take, we know the location of where that centroid is for each component. We subtract the distance to the neutral axis itself, Y bar, that gives you the uh, relative distance and we just have to make an absolute value and we should be uh, good, away, good to go. So let's do that. We'll set it all up in the absolute value. We need y at i and we subtract from that y sub bar. Oh. Subtract from that y sub bar and go outside and if we hit our equal sign and we see we get this small array with all of those uh, distances. So that's a really nice, easy, tight way. And we're starting to see some of the advantages of having all of these uh, uh, bits of information contained in arrays because we can get to the answers really quick.
Okay, so we're just uh, setting ourselves up. Uh, the first component within the parallel axis theorem is the uh, local moment of inertia of the individual components about their uh, respective uh, centroids. Uh, so we're going to need to get those. So we're going to have an array in I. So we start with I1. And of course, they're all rectangles, so they're all BH cubed over 12. In the generic, it's just a matter of using the right components. And so in the first one, we have our top flange multiplied by the thickness of the flange top and that's all cubed and that's divided by 12. And of course this is in the generic going to be applied to each of them so we may as well get a couple of those instances over here. And so I2 is for the web and so we have the thickness of the web and remember we had the height of the web here so we'll grab that bring that down height of the web all cubed over 12 and just let's carry some values here so we can see what's going on and so the final one is the flange at the bottom so flange bottom and bottom and we as well get them all out there so we can see the individual values of course when we do this by hand quite often we do it in a little table uh, or even when we're running it through our calculator we want to get the individual components just so when we make a, a finger problem on the calculator we can go back and verify so here you go we we're seeing them all three and let me get the next label out here. So now we're going to calculate the moment of inertia of the composite section. So I is equal to, and we're just basically going to type out the parallel axis theorem. So again, we use the summation sign. It's still using I and get here so all in brackets we have the individual eyes about their respective axes and then we have our individual areas which are multiplied by their distances from the, the neutral axis so that's the d array that we came up with so that's d at i There we go, and we're getting a value. Now, some of these values, I, I'm gonna tidy them up later. I, I don't really love the scientific notation. I'm gonna change all of those to engineering notation, but I can get to that uh, when we get finished. You probably don't wanna watch me do that. Uh, so that's not bad. The last thing we need to do is we need to determine what the first moment of area or, or Q is and we'll calculate that at the neutral axis. Obviously, you'd have to adjust that depending on what your interests are. So let me get that set up. Okay, so there, uh, I've just put in a, an image just uh, to manage the logic. Of course, we're down to two areas. You're working from on one side of the neutral axis or the other, or whatever spot in the neutral, uh, on the cross section you're interested. Uh, so now we have to redefine the parameters of two. And so when we think back to the equation, typically it refers to a y, and the y is the distance of the centroid of the individual component from the neutral axis. So that was d in one of our other equations. I'm just going to convert that to a y just so I can stay consistent with what's in our notes. We have our y1, and that's going to be equal to our d1 and that's just to, to match formats. Okay, and now what we need to do is we have to derive the parameters for the area two. And 
And the easiest thing for me to do just to save on time is I'm going to define an h2 in this case. So that's going to be h minus, let's see, overall h minus y bar minus the thickness of the top flange. So that gives us a y, and that just means that our equations will not be cluttered, if you will. So now our y2 is equal to our h2 divided by 2. And we also need our area 2. Our thickness of the web multiplied by our h2. There we go. And so the last thing to do is to calculate the Q of the neutral axis. And if you recall from the formula, once again, we're up picking up our summation sign. This is I. Now, what I don't think I mentioned, I, when I set up this section, I redefined my range variable just 1 to 2 to match the 2 here. Uh, there's other ways to do it. I could have used J, you could have used K. I chose to reuse I. And that then becomes right, A at I multiplied by Y at I. And that's typically expressed in millimeters cubed, not liters. So we can change the units there. And that's great. Now, when we set this all up, those, that's the last of our calculations. Uh, I did say that I set it up in an area, a collapsible area. I do this because it's very, very easy to port that to other uh, worksheets and, and then collapse it, leave it open, do whatever you have to do. But the normally what I do is I put all of my uh, derived parameters on the outside. So what do we have? We have y bar is a value. We had our a total might be useful. Uh, that's a value. We had our i in millimeters to the fourth and we had q neutral axis, and again, millimeters cubed. And we can just snug those up there, so that's not bad. So then when you're not working on those themselves, you can just have this within any other spread, uh, worksheet and uh, see what the values are, but not have to worry about how they're derived. Now, again, the value of this is, is that these are all adjustable. And for example, if you wanted to have a T-beam, you could move that to zero and all of the values would adjust. This has zero depth to it and everything works for a T-beam. So it works for an I-beam, works for an asymmetric I-beam, works for a T-beam, uh, works just about every normal section that fits into a rectangle. So, um, Lots of little things there, lots of little uh, quirks using the arrays instead of just, uh, you know, using subscripts. Uh, I think it keeps it nice and tight. You can get everything done fairly quickly. And it's a very useful worksheet for other worksheets that you would be using. You would rarely be doing this just for the cross section uh, uh, without uh, having another problem that goes with it. So easily portable to other worksheets. So if that was useful to you, uh, that's great. And uh, we'll keep looking for another one to do and we'll see you at that.